Necessity of holiness further argued from our own state and condition in this world with what is required of us with respect to our giving glory to Jesus Christ. Another argument for the necessity of holiness may be taken from the consideration of ourselves in our present state and condition. For it is by this alone that the vicious distemper of our nature is or can be cured, that our nature is fearfully and universally depraved by the entrance of sin. Uh, before declared and sufficiently confirmed, and I do not now consider it as to the disability of living to God, or enmity to Him, which has come on us, nor yet as to the future punishment which it renders us liable to, but it is the present misery that is upon us by it, unless it be cured that I intend. For the mind of man being possessed with darkness, vanity, folly and instability, the will under the power of spiritual death is stubborn and obstinate, and all the affections are carnal, sensual and selfish, the whole soul being hurried off from God, and so out of its way, is perpetually filled with confusion and perplexing disorder. It is not unlike that description which Job gives of the grave, a land of darkness, and of the shadow of death, without any order, and where the light is as darkness, chapter 10, 21, and 22. When Solomon set himself to search out the causes of all the vanity and vexation that is in this world, of all the troubles that the life of man is filled with, he affirms that this was the sum of his discovery. God made man upright, but they have found out many inventions. Ecclesiastes 7 verse 29, that is, cast themselves into endless entanglements and confusions. What is sin and its guilt, its punishment and its power, is the greatest that men are liable to in this world? Hence God, for the guilt of some sins, penally gives them up to the power of others. Romans 1 verses 24 to 28, 2 Thessalonians 2, 11 and 12. He does this not only to secure and aggravate their condemnation at the last day, but to give them in this world the recompense of their folly in themselves. For there is no greater misery nor slavery than to be under the power of sin. This proves the original deprivation of our nature, the whole soul, filled with darkness, disorder, and confusion, being brought under the power of various lusts and passions, captivating the mind and will to their interests in the vilest drudgeries of servitude and bondage. No sooner does the mind begin to act anything suitably to the small remainders of light in it, but it is immediately controlled by impetuous loss and affections, which darken its directions and silence its commands. Hence the whole soul is filled with fierce contradictions and conflicts, vanity, instability, folly, sensual, irrational appetites, inordinate desires, self-disquieting and torturing passions that act continually in our depraved natures. See the account of this in Romans 3, 10 to 18. How full is a world of disorder, confusion, oppression, rapine, uncleanness, violence, and the like dreadful miseries. Alas, they are but a weak and imperfect representation of the evils that are in the minds of men by nature, for as they all proceed from thence, as our Savior declares in Matthew fifteen eighteen to 19 so the thousandth part of what is conceived in this is never brought forth and acted. From whence comes wars and fightings among you? Do they not come? From your lust that war in your members, you lust, and you do not have. You kill and desire to have, and you cannot obtain it. You fight in war, yet you do not have it. James 4, 1 and 2. All evils proceed from the impetuous lust of the minds of men, which when they are acted to the utmost are as unsatisfied as they were at their first setting out. Hence the prophet Isaiah tells us that wicked men under the power and disorder of depraved nature are like the troubled sea when it cannot rest, 
whose waters cast up mire and dirt, and they have no peace. Chapter 57, 20, and 21 The heart is in continual motion. It's restless in its figments and imaginations as the waters of the sea when it is stormy and troubled. And they are all evil, only evil, continually. Genesis 6, verse 5 and this does it cast up mire and dirt, and those who seem to have the greatest advantages above others, in power and opportunity to give satisfaction to their lusts, do but increase their own disquietness and miseries. Psalm 69 verse 14 For as these things are evil in themselves and to others, so they are penal to those in whom they are, especially in whom they abound and reign. And if their breasts were opened, it would appear by the confusion and horror they live in that they are on the very confines of hell. Hence is the life of man full of vanity, trouble, disappointments, vexations, and endless self-dissatisfactions, which those who were wise among the heathen saw. They complained of it and attempted in vain to relieve all these things proceed from the deprivation of our nature and the disorder that has come upon us by sin. And as, as if they are not cured and healed, they will assuredly issue an everlasting misery. So they are woeful and calamitous at present. True peace, rest, and tranquility of mind are strangers to such souls. Alas, what are the perishing prophets' pleasures and satisfactions by them which this world can afford? How unable is the mind of man to find out rest and peace in them, or from them? They quickly satiate and suffocate in their enjoyment, and become to have no relish in their varieties, which only heighten present vanity and treasure up provision for future vexation. We have, therefore, no greater interest in the world than to inquire how this disorder may be cured, and a stop put to this fountain of all abominations. What we intend will be cleared in the ensuing observations. 1. It is true that some are naturally of a more sedate and quiet temper and disposition than others are. They don't fall into such outrages and excesses of outward sins as others do. Nay, their minds are not capable of such turbulent passions and affections as the most are possessed with. These people comparatively are peaceable and useful to their relations and others, but yet their minds and hearts are full of darkness and disorder, for so it is with all by nature, who have not an almighty effectual cure wrought upon them, and the less troublesome waves they have on the surface the more mire and dirt oftentimes they have at the bottom. Number two, education, convictions, afflictions, illuminations, hope to obtain a righteousness of their own, love of their reputation, engagements in the society of good men, their resolutions for secular ends, with other means of the like kind, often put great restraints on the actings and ebullitions of the evil imaginations and turbulent affections of the minds of men. Yea, the frame of the mind, in the course of the life, may be much changed by them. How, wherein, and how far is not our present business to declare. Number three, notwithstanding all that may be effected by these means, or any other of like nature, the disease is uncured. The soul continues still in its disorder, and in all inward confusion, for our original order, harmony, and rectitude consisted in the powers and inclinations of our minds, wills, and affections to regular actings toward God as our end and reward. Hence proceeded all that order and peace which were in all their faculties and their actings. While we continue in due order towards God, it was impossible that we should be otherwise in ourselves. By being by sin fallen off from God, having lost our conformity and likeness to Him, we fell into all the confusion and disorder before described. Therefore, the only cure and remedy of this evil condition is by holiness, for it must be, and can be no otherwise, 
but by the renovation of the image of God in us. For from the loss of this, all the evil mentioned spring and arise. By this are our souls in some measure restored to their primitive order and rectitude. Without this, it tends for inward peace, real tranquility of mind with due order in our affections will be in vain attempted. It is the holy soul, the sanctified mind alone, that is composed into an orderly tendency towards the enjoyment of God. That which we aim at is what we are directed to by our apostle in Ephesians 4, 22-24. Our deliverance from the power of corrupt and deceitful lusts, which are the spring and cause of all the confusion mentioned, is by the renovation of the image of God in us and no otherwise. And hence, to all persons not in love with their lusts and ruin, arises a cogent argument and motive to holiness. But a number of things may be objected to this. This first, that we do admit to maintain that in all sanctified persons there are yet certain remainders of our original deprivation and disorder, sin still abides in believers, yea, that it works powerfully and effectually in them leading them captive to the law of sin. Hence, in so great and mighty wars and conflicts in the souls of regenerate persons that are truly sanctified, in this they suffer so far as to groan, complain, and cry out for deliverance, the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary. Therefore it does not appear that this holiness so heals and cures the sinful distempers of our minds. On the other side, men suppose as yet, under the power of sin, who have not that grace and holiness and the renovation of the image of God which is pleaded for, seem to have more peace and quietness in their minds. They have not that inward conflict which others complain of, nor those groans for deliverance. Yea, they find satisfactions in their lusts and pleasures, believing themselves by them against anything that occasions their trouble. Answer. Number one. It's for that peace and order which is pretended to be in the minds of men, under the power of sin, and not sanctified. It is like that which is in hell in the kingdom of darkness. Satan is not divided against himself nor is there such a confusion and disorder in his kingdom as to destroy it. But it has a consistency from the common end of all that is in it, which is, in opposition to God and all that is good, such a peace and order there may be in an unsanctified mind, there being no active principle in it for God, and that which is spiritually good. All works one way, and all his troubled streams have the same course. But yet, they continually cast up mire and dirt. There is only that peace in such minds which a strong man armed, that is, Satan keeps his goods in until a stronger than he comes to bind him. And if anyone think to peace in order to be sufficient for him, and which his mind and all of its faculties acts uniformly against God, or for self, sin in the world, Without any opposition or contradiction, he may find as much in hell when he comes there. Number two, there is a difference between a confusion and a rebellion. Where confusion is in a state, all ruler government is dissolved, and everyone is let loose to the utmost disorder and evil. But where the rule is firm and stable, there may be rebellions that may give some parts and places disturbance and damage but yet the whole state is not disordered by it. So is it in the condition of a sanctified soul on account of the remainders of sin. There may be rebellion in it, but there is no confusion. Grace keeps a rule in the mind and heart firm and stable, so that there is peace and assurance to the whole state of the person, though loss and corruptions will be rebelling and warring against it. The divine order, therefore, of the soul consisting in the rule of grace, subordinating all to God in Christ, is never overthrown by the rebellion of sin at any time, be it never so vigorous or prevalent. But in the state of unsanctified persons, though there is no rebellion, yet is there nothing but confusion. 
Sin has a role in dominion in them, and however men may be pleased with it for a season, yet is it nothing but a perfect disorder, because it is a continual opposition to God. It is a tyranny that overthrows all law and rule and order, with respect to our last and chiefest sin. Number three, the soul of a believer has such a satisfaction in this conflict, is that its peace is not ordinarily disturbed, and is never quite overthrown by it. Such a person knows sin to be his enemy, knows his design with the aids and assistances which are prepared for him against his deceit and violence, and considering the nature and end of this contest, is satisfied with it. Yea, the greatest hardships that sin can reduce a believer to do but put him to the exercise of those graces and duties in which he receives great spiritual satisfaction, such a repentance, humiliation, Godly sorrow, self-abasement, and abhorrency with fervent outcries for deliverance. Now, although the things seem to have that which is grievous and dolorous prevailing in them, yet the graces of the Spirit of God be enacted in them, they are so suited to the nature of the new creature, it so belong to the spiritual order of the soul, that it finds secret satisfaction in them all. But to trouble others meet with in their own hearts and minds on the account of sin is from the severe reflections of their consciences only, and they receive them no otherwise but as certain presages and predictions of future and eternal misery. A sanctified person is secured of success in its conflict, which keeps blessed peace and order in his soul during its continuance. There is a twofold success against the rebellious actings of the remainders of indwelling sin, one in particular instances, two in the whole cause, and in both these have we sufficient assurance of success if we be not wanting to ourselves. For suppose a contest be considered with respect to any particular lust and corruption, and that in conjunction with some powerful temptation, we have sufficient and blessed assurance that abiding in the diligent use of the ways and means assigned to us, and the improvement of the assistant provided in the covenant of grace, we shall not so fail of actual success as that lust should conceive, bring forth, and finish sin. James 1 verse 15 But if we are lacking to ourselves, negligent in our known duties and principal concerns, it is no wonder if we are sometimes cast into disorder and foiled by the power of sin. But as to the general success in the whole cause, namely, that sin shall not utterly deface your image in us, nor absolutely or finally ruin our souls, which is its end and tendency. We do have the covenant faithfulness of God, which will not fail us for our security. Romans 6.14 Therefore, notwithstanding this opposition and all that is ascribed to it, there is peace and order preserved by the power of holiness in a sanctified mind and soul. Secondly, but it will be further objected than that many professors who pretend highly to sanctification and holiness, and whom you judge to be partakers of them, are yet peevish, forward, morose, and quiet in their minds, among their relations, and in the world, a much outward vanity and disorder, which you make tokens of the internal confusion of the minds of men and of the power of sin, to either proceed from them or are carried on by them. And where then is the advantage pretended that should render holiness so indispensably necessary to us? Answer, if there are any such, the more shame for them, and they must bear their own judgment. These things are diametrically opposite to the work of holiness and the fruits of the Spirit. Galatians 5.22 and therefore I say that many it may be are esteemed holy and sanctified, who indeed are not so, though I will judge no man in particular, yet I'd rather pass his judgment on any man, that he has no grace, than that on the other hand grace does not change our nature and renew the image of God in us. Many who are really holy may have the double disadvantage first, to be under such circumstances, this will frequently draw out their natural infirmities, and then to have them greatened and heightened in the apprehension of them with whom they have to do, which was actually the case of David all of his days, and of Hannah, First Samuel 1, 6 and 7. 
I would be far from giving countenance to the sinful distempers of any, but yet I do not doubt but that the infirmities of many are represented by envy and hatred of profession to an undeserved disadvantage. Number three, wherever there is a seat of grace and holiness, there an entrance is made on the cure of all those sinful distempers, ye not only of the corrupt lusts of the flesh, that are absolutely evil and vicious in their whole nature, but even of those natural infirmities and distempers of peevishness, moroseness, inclination to anger and passion, unsteadiness and resolution, which lust is apt to possess and used to evil and disorderly ends. And I am pressing the necessity of holiness, that is, of the increase and growth of it, that this work may be carried on to perfection, and that so, through the power of the grace of the gospel, that great promise may be accomplished, which is recorded in Isaiah 11, 6-9. I find that there is no end of arguments that offer their service to the purpose in hand. I shall waive many, and those of great importance attended with an unavoidable cogency, and close this discourse with one which must not be omitted. In our holiness consists a principal part of that revenue of glory and honor, which the Lord Christ requires and expects from his disciples in the world. That he does require this indispensably of us is out of question amongst us, although the most who are called Christians live as if they had no other design but to cast all obloquies, reproach, and shame on him and his doctrine. But if we are indeed his disciples, he has bought us with a price, and we are not our own but his and that to glorify him in soul and body, because they are his. He died for us, that so we should not live to ourselves, but to him that so died for us, and by virtue of whose death we live. He gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity, and purify to himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. But we need not insist on this. To deny that we ought to glorify and honor Christ in the world, is to renounce him and the gospel. The sole inquiry is how we may do so, and what he requires of us to that purpose. Now, the sum of all that the Lord Christ expects from us in this world may be reduced to these two heads. 1. That we should live holily to him. 2. That we should suffer patiently for him. And in these things alone is he glorified by us. The first he expects at all times and in all things. The latter on particular occasions as we are called by him to that end. Where these things are, where this revenue of glory is paid in and returned to him, he does not repent of his purchase, nor of the invaluable price he has paid for us. Yea, in fact, says, the lines are fallen to me in pleasant places. Yea, I have a goodly heritage which are the words of Christ concerning the church, which is his lot, and the portion of his inheritance. Now, amongst many others, we shall consider but one way in which we glorify the Lord Christ by our holy obedience, and whence also it will appear how much we dishonor and reproach him when we come short of this. The Lord Christ, coming into the world, is a mediator between God and man, wrought and accomplished a mighty work amongst us, and what he did may be referred to three heads. One, the life which he led, two, the doctrine which he taught, and three, the death which he underwent. Concerning all these, there ever was a great contest in the world, and it is yet continued. And on that part of the world it is managed under a double appearance, for some openly have traduced his life as unholy, his doctrine is foolish, and his death is justly deserved, which was the sense of the pagan world in the apostate judicial church of old, as it is of many at this day. Others allow them to pass with some approbation, pretending to own what is taught in the gospel concerning them, but in fact and practice deny any such power and efficacy in them as is pretended, and without which they are of no virtue which is a way of carnal evangelicals and all idolatrous superstitious worshippers among Christians. And of late there is risen up amongst us a generation who esteem all that is spoken concerning him to be a mere fable. In opposition to this, 
The Lord Christ calls us, his true disciples, to bear witness and testimony to the holiness of his life, the wisdom and purity of his doctrine, the efficacy of his death to expiate sin, to make atonement and peace with God, with the power of his whole mediation to renew the image of God in us, to restore us to his favor, and to bring us to the enjoyment of him. This he calls us, his disciples, to avow to and express in the world, and by their so doing is he glorified, and no otherwise, in a peculiar manner. A testimony is to be given to and against the world, that his life was most holy, his doctrine most heavenly and pure, his death most precious and efficacious, and consequently that he was sent of God to his great work, and was accepted of him in it. Now all this is no otherwise done but by our obedience to him in holiness, as it is visible and fruitful. For we are obliged to profess that the life of Christ is our example. This in the first place we are called to, and every Christian does virtually make that profession. No man takes that holy name upon him, but the first thing he signifies by it is that he makes the life of Christ his pattern, which it is his duty to express in his own. And he who takes up Christianity on any other terms does woefully deceive his own soul. How is it then that we may yield a revenue of glory in this? How may we bear testimony to the holiness of his life against the blasphemies of the world and the unbelief of the most who have no regard to this end? Can this be any otherwise done but by holiness of heart and life, by conformity to God in our souls and living to God in fruitful obedience? Can men devise a more effectual expedient to cast reproach on him than to live in sin? to follow their lusts and pleasures, to prefer the world and present things before eternity, and in the meantime to profess that the life of Christ is their example, as all unholy professors and Christians do, is not this to bear witness with the world against him, that indeed his life was unholy? Surely it is high time for such persons to leave the name of Christians, or leave the life of sin. It is therefore in conformity alone to him and the holiness we are pressing after that we can give him any glory on the account of his life being our example. Number two, we can give him no glory unless we bear testimony to his doctrine, that it is holy, heavenly, filled with divine wisdom and grace, as we make it our rule. And there is no other way in which this may be done but by holy obedience expressing the nature, end, and usefulness of it. And indeed, the holy obedience of believers, as has been declared at large before, is a thing quite of another kind than anything in the world which, by the rules, principles, and light of nature we are directed to or instructed in. It is spiritual, heavenly, mysterious, filled with principles and actings of the same kind with those whereby our communion with God and glory to eternity shall be maintained. Now, Although the life of evangelical holiness be in its principle, form, and chief acting, secret and hidden, hidden with Christ and God from the eyes of the world, so that the men thereof neither see nor know nor discern the spiritual life of a believer in its being, form, and power, yet there are always such evident appearing fruits of it as are sufficient for their conviction that the rule of it, which is the doctrine of Christ alone, is holy, wise, and heavenly. And multitudes in all ages have been won over to the obedience of the gospel and faith in Christ Jesus by the holy, fruitful, useful conversation of such as have expressed the power and purity of his doctrine in this kind. Number 3. The power and efficacy of the death of Christ is for other ends, so to purify us from all iniquity and to purge our conscience from dead works that we may serve the living God is herein also required. The world indeed sometimes rises to that height of pride and contemptuous atheism as to despise all appearance and profession of purity. But the truth is, if we are not cleansed from our sins in the blood of Christ, if we are not thereby purified from iniquity, we are an abomination to God and shall be objects of his wrath forever. However, the Lord Christ requires no more of his disciples in this manner to its glory 
but that they profess that his blood cleanses them from their sins and evidence the truth of it by such ways and means as the gospel has appointed to that end. If their testimony herein to the efficacy of his death be not received, be despised by the world, and so at present no apparent glory redound to him by it. He is satisfied with it as knowing that the day is coming in which he will call over to thee things again, when the rejecting of this testimony shall be an aggravation of condemnation to the unbelieving world. I suppose the evidence of this last argument is plain and exposed to all. It is briefly this. Without the holiness prescribed in the gospel, we give nothing of that glory to Jesus Christ which he indispensably requires. And if men will be so sottishly foolish as to expect the greatest benefits and advantages by the mediation of Christ, namely pardon of sin, salvation, life, and immortality, while they neglect and refuse to give him any revenue of glory for all he has done for them, we may be well their folly, but cannot prevent their ruin. He saves us freely by his grace, but he requires that we should express a sense of it in ascribing to him the glory that is his due. And let no man think this is done in wordy expressions. It is no otherwise effected but by the power of a holy conversation, showing forth the praises of him who has called us out of darkness into his marvelous light. Nay, there is more in it also. If anyone profess himself to be a Christian, that is, a disciple of Jesus Christ, to follow the example of his life, to obey his doctrine, to express the efficacy of his death, and continue in an unholy life, he is a false traitor to him, and gives in his testimony on the side of the world against him and all that he has done for us. And it is indeed the flagitious lives of professed Christians that have brought the life, doctrine, and person of our Lord Jesus Christ into contempt in the world. And I advise all that read or hear of these things diligently and carefully to study the gospel, that they may receive thence an evidence of the power, truth, glory, and beauty of Christ and his ways. For he that should consider the conversation of men for his guide will be hardly able to determine which he should choose, whether to be a pagan, a Mohammedan, or a Christian. And shall such persons, by reason of whom the name of Christ is dishonored and blasphemed, continually expect advantage by him, or mercy from him? Will men think to live in sensuality, pride, ambition, covetousness, malice, revenge, hatred of all good men, and contempt of purity, and yet to enjoy life, immortality, and glory by Christ? Who can sufficiently bewail the dreadful effects of such a horrid infatuation? God teach us all duly to consider that all the glory and honor of Jesus Christ in the world with respect to us depends on our holiness and not on any other thing either that we are, have, or may do. If therefore we have any love to him, any spark of gratitude for his unspeakable love, grace, condescension, sufferings, with the eternal fruits of them, any care about or desire of his glory and honor in the world, if we would not be found the most hateful traitors at the last day to his crown, honor, and dignity, if we have any expectation of grace from him, or advantage by him here or hereafter, let us labor to be holy in all manner of conversation, that we may thereby adorn his doctrine, express his virtue and praises, and grow up into conformity and likeness to him who is the firstborn, an image of the invisible God.